So hello, uh, my name is Juan Pablo Romero. Um, I'm, I would like to take you on a tour on string diagrams and Monel categories. I have a few goals on this talk. Um, first of all, I would like to show you why Monel categories are a good modeling tool for certain class of uh, domains. Also, I'd like to show how Monel categories can be represented graphically via string diagrams. And given the time constraint, I'll go rather quickly, uh, but please don't hesitate, hesitate to ask questions after the presentation. Before starting, I would like to mention a, um, four exceptional resources, in my opinion. Um, the first of all, the first one is uh, Applied Category Theory by Fong and Spivak. I think this is more or less well known um, in the community. Um, has a broad range of applications, um, uh, databases, uh, resource management, etc. The second one, I don't think it's, it's it's as well known, partially because it's not specifically about um, you know computer science, but I think it's fascinating. It really shows the power of monadal categories to to model like a broad range of um, phenomena, ranging from linear algebra, logic, physics, um, computer science, etc. Um, I put the full reference um, uh, at the end of the presentation. I also, uh, this is an interesting book as well. Um, if you're interested in quantum computation, it presented in a non-traditional way. Uh, this book starts very slowly building the, lang the diagrammatic language that we're gonna use, and then eventually just swaps into um, quantum computation. And this is, this is the, the, the PhD thesis, thesis from one of the authors. It's much faster, just goes straight, it's hardcore, but goes straight to the, to the point. Anyway, so let's talk about processes first. Consider the following examples. A, um, this is a Scala function, just sort. Um, consider also this mathematical function or also a cooking recipe, some ingredients, and there's an output. Um, a two by three matrix, such as this, and a, a USB cord, right? Taking a, um, an input device and an out, into an output device. All these examples can be described in a very general way as processes. So we will define a process as anything that has zero or more inputs and zero or more outputs. And it can be represented by a, by a box uh, with two set of wires, right? Inputs on the left and outputs on the right. The examples that we saw before can be represented as diagrams in, the, in this way. So this is the certain function. This is the mathematical function. Uh, cooking is clearly a, a process, right? Take, taking uh, some, some materials, some, some ingredients into, into a dish. Uh, USB cord which is not a process per se as we normally consider it, and the matrix. So in general, boxes represent processes occurring over time, um, a machine, a mathemat mathematical function, for example. Uh, wires, on the other hand, they have labels and they represent flow of data, uh, systems, ingredients, supplies, uh, data types, or even actual physical wires, such as the USB cord. Now, there are, um, processes can be combined in different ways, right? Uh, perhaps the simplest possible way is basically by putting one um, uh, diagram on top of each other, uh, such as in this case. This is called a parallel composition. And it should be noted that parallel in this case means simply logically independent. That's it. So we can see how two diagrams and we have a combined diagram on the right. They can also be composed sequentially, uh, but with a caveat that the, um, the input and output wires have to match. In this case, we see um, a process with two wires on the right, B and D, and uh, the other process, same wires uh, as inputs. So we can combine them to form a composite diagram such as this, right? And given a diagram constructed uh, by sequential and parallel composition, uh, such as this, um, we can decompose it in individual elements. Uh, but it should be noted that the composition is not necessarily unique. 
here's an example of one such decomposition. Um, yeah, this is one possible, but there, there might be others. So a, by a process theory, we will understand an interpretation of a diagram in terms of a concrete class of processes. In particular, um, it provides an interpretation of wires, the boxes, and also the composition operation of the diagrams. Uh, some examples are functions and sets, linear maps and vector spaces, and matrices and natural numbers. Um, we will consider diagrams that can be deformed into each other as equal, right? As long as um, the boxes are connected in the same way, uh, such as in this case, uh, you can, we can move them around as long as we don't change the connectivity. So um, the moral is only connectivity matters. Here's another example. In this case, we just move internally up and down, but same thing, the connectivity didn't change. These kind of graphical equations that we have here that always hold uh, are, are, are called diagram equations. On the other hand, uh, on each concrete process theory, there will be certain equations that are only valid for, for this particular theory. Um, for example, in this case, uh, this diagram uh, is valid. It's, it's a valid equation, but only when talking about computer programs. And, and it's not a valid, you know, it's not a valid equation in all possible interpretations, right? This, the fact that this, those two um, diagrams are equal relies on the fact that we are thinking on uh, the sort function in the, in, in, in the programming, in a computer uh, program. Here's another example of a valid equation uh, in the domain of natural numbers and addition, right? Uh, in both cases, we have different diagrams that correspond to the same process in particular theory. This, these kind of equations are called process equations. So with this introduction out of the way, let's uh, explore some of the algebraic aspects of these diagrams. This, this diagrammatic language that we discussed uh, can be formalized by using category theory, specifically in monoid categories. So here's our plan. We will describe each of those four structures, categories, monoidal categories, Cartesian, and symmetric model categories. And each one of them will give rise to a little language with certain operations. So first of all, let's, let's do a quick recap on, on categories. Um, a category is a set of objects. Each object has a, a loop around it. Uh, we call this an identity uh, at this object. We also have, um, given any two objects, we have a set of arrows between those two objects. And um, the arrows can be uh, concatenated, can be composed by concatenation. So you can think of a, of a category as a directed multigraph where um, the edges are allowed to have multiple nodes. Now, in terms of string diagrams, arrows are processes and uh, they're represented as boxes as we, as we discussed before. And um, the objects uh, are the short wires attached to the left and on the right, right? They are usually attached to the, to the boxes. The identities have a special symbol um, and they, rep they are represented as full wires. And um, arrow decomposition uh, can be depicted in, in this way. Uh, so this is just uh, adding, we're establishing a new vocabulary of, of uh, pictures, right? Or, or icons. And we also require that certain conditions are satisfied. Uh, first of all, we need uh, that the identities behave as neutral elements uh, with respect to the, to the composition um, on the left or on the right. And we also need that the composition is associative. So it doesn't really matter which order we apply the operation. Uh, the end result is the same. So we just ignore the, the parentheses. As a running example, consider the category of matrices and natural numbers. So in this case, the objects will be natural numbers. Arrows from n to m will be matrices of dimension m by n. So you can see here two, two matrices A uh, and B. And just as a, as a, as a, as a, as a um, trick to remember, 
uh, you know, the, the input corresponds to the, the input dimension corresponds to the number of columns and the output dimension corresponds to the number of rows. Um, and then the composition is will be matrix multiplication. So which is represented uh, like, like so. So we have in this case, um, A multiplied by, by B, we have a, 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 another matrix going from, from the number P to the number M. Uh, the identity at the number n is just uh, the, the identity matrix. So, so this example is interesting because um, normally we consider objects as, as kind of like systems, right? Like, I don't know, the, the category of groups or vector spaces. But in this case, it shows that, you know, objects can be something much more simpler. They're simply um, um, compatibility conditions that allows us to compose multiple arrows. Nothing more than that. So um, after having defined uh, categories, let's talk about uh, something called strict monoidal categories, which is the simplest version of uh, monoidal categories. It's just a category with a monoid structure on the objects and arrows. Um, so just to explain all the details, um, the idea of parallel composition that we discussed before is captured by uh, the so-called tensor product um, which is a, an, an associative binary operation. Uh, it's also called sometimes the monodal product. Uh, and it's, uh, we use this, this, uh, this, this uh, times with a circle operator. And it has to be defined in both the objects uh, uh, as wires here, and also on the arrows. And it matches what we saw before, right? It just means placing either two wires on top of each other or two um, two boxes on top of each other. We also need a neutral or unit object, which is represented as the empty box. Both the object and the unit arrow on, on, on I is represented as the empty box. And we can see here that it behaves as a neutral element uh, with respect to the parallel composition. And here's an example of um, this is a morphism from I to B. And since we are using this special symbol, uh, we're using the, the empty space to indicate uh, the I, this is how you would represent a, a morphism or an arrow from I to B, right? As something that only produces uh, something of type B. And one more law, this is one of the most important laws. This law guarantees or establishes the relationship between the sequential and the parallel composition. And it basically says that we can compose sequentially. If you look at the, at, at, at the picture here, uh, there's two ways we can create this diagram, right? We can either compose sequentially F1 and then G1 and gives us the top part. And then we can compose F2 and then G2. And then we can stack them on top of each other. That's one way. The other way is to stack F1 on top of F2, and then G1 on top of G2, and then we just compose uh, sequ uh, sequentially those two together. So this law or equation uh, basically guarantees that it doesn't really matter which order we do the composition, the results should be the same. Uh, going back to our example of matrices, <clears throat> Um, matrices can be, uh, they, they form a monoidal category if we use uh, what it's called as, uh, known as the Kronecker product, uh, as the parallel composition of arrows. And it operates as multiplication on natural numbers. So given two matrices A and B like this, from N to M and, and, and Q to B, the Kronecker product, it's this big matrix here. Um, I'm not gonna dwell on this, but just notice that this is a um, this is this is a block matrix, right? So each entry is not actually a number, for example. Rather, this is just a symbolic form to express that each entry is a copy of B multiplied with the corresponding uh, entry of A. And so you can see how um, the dimensions uh, end up like this, right? So basically, we are just multiplying the input dimensions and the output dimensions, and we have a, a really big matrix. And of course, the, the zero, the number zero would be the, the unit element, right? Uh, it corresponds to the empty matrix. 
So, um, you know, this is all good, but unfortunately, in many situations, the monoidless um, associativity and identity element are not strictly satisfied, right? So this, so this kind of equation is not strictly satisfied. Um, as, a, as a very simple example, right, in Scala, uh, if we take the tuple on the left and the tuple on the right, uh, they have different types, even though they're clearly isomorphic. And this is a common, uh, a common situation. Um, so instead, we have to relax our conditions, and instead of requiring equality, we will require isomorphisms between uh, composition, uh, between the, between the two ways to associate the, the tensor product. Uh, this isomorphism is called the associator and depends on three objects. And we also need um, uh, those isomorphisms, the left and right unitors are called like this. And they satisfy certain laws that I'm going to gloss over for now. So this was uh, uh, monodal categories. The next um, gadget that we're going to explore is uh, what is called a Cartesian monodal category. In this type of category, we have a few more operations. We have uh, a way to extract the first and second components. And it is represented like, like this. We also have a way to duplicate information. Given an A, we can just you know, uh, output two, two copies of the input. And we can also discard information. Given an A, we just ignore it, right? Uh, finally, in a symmetric monodal category, we have uh, what is called a swap operation. And uh, the icon here is chosen carefully like this. So when you see these two crossing um, wires, it means that it's, it is a specifically the swap operation on a, on a, um, on a symmetric monodal category. The inverse is depicted like this. So it's very similar, but notice how the wires are in different, um, let's say, uh, different order. And well, this representation is chosen so that, you know, this diagram kind of makes sense. The idea is that if you look at this diagram, right, it, our graphical or geometrical intuition tells us that we can just like straighten those wires together and we should get two wires, right? And this is true because we're depicting the inverse in this way. So this is one of the, I guess, themes of uh, string diagrams. Try to utilize our existing geometrical intuition to um, kind of like um, make it easy to understand some algebraic um, equations or properties. And furthermore, um, in a symmetric model category, we specifically, we require that the swap satisfies this equation. And with this equation, it's pretty much the same as Establishing this other equation, right? So, you know, we swap with with the swap operation. We can we can twist or braid, and if we do it two times, we get back the um, the identity like this, or you know, two wires. So this is um, the diagrams that have been discussing so far. If you notice, they contain no loops, and to be more precise, they're normally called circuit diagrams. Um, feedback loops can be introduced. Uh, by using what is known as compact closed categories, which we'll be discussing here. But the, the moral is that there's a zoo of different um, extensions, right, to, to, to the basic monad category definition with different requirements. And uh, basically, depending on what the application is, you can reach out to different, different, um, different cases. Uh, okay, let's talk about um, string diagrams in Scala. As, a, as another running example application, uh, consider uh, an Airflow-like process manager. Um, if you have used, if you haven't used it, Airflow allows you to create a graph of nodes, such as the one uh, depicted here, and each node, uh, you know, performs certain operation. Um, so in this Toy example, imagine that this each node represents the act an action such as making an HTTP call or maybe running a program. And the wires in this example represent um, typed information moving from one process to another. Uh, by type, I mean that it would be an error to maybe feed you know uh, uh, something of the incorrect type to the to the next uh, to the next box. 
So um, here's how a DSL created for this purpose would be used in this uh, would be used. So we will we will we will describe this later, but uh, this is one way right, to to use it. Um, I'm I'm using the double plus to indicate parallel composition. So you can see also by the by the lines here how you would compose this this um, this diagram. Right, you you have the identity arrow and then put it on top of P1, which is something that outputs C. And then in this case P2, it's a process that takes two inputs and you know outputs uh, something of type D, and we just to, we just um, use sequential composition. Uh, at this point, we can use one of our existing operators, the first, to discard the second and just keep the first uh, the first um, input. So we can feed it to the next. So this is this is how we just compose these operations. Um, so next, this is another. Uh, this is part of the diagram, right? We have uh, another piece of the diagram or fragment. Uh, this is another part of the diagram. That this is uh, of this example. Uh, the delta here, it, it's just the duplicate information. Sorry, the duplicate operation. So presumably, if we if, if we have a, an input of type A, we can just you know duplicate as many times times as we like, um, and just so that all the wires are connected properly. And finally, we have this um, this hypothetical node uh, T. Uh, so the whole thing becomes uh, a, a building block, uh, block uh, or a graph that takes an input A and has an output of type B, right? And this is our program. So we can we can use you know the tagless encoding uh, to create uh, a process uh, DSL with all the operations needed 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 in our domain. Um, since we want something very general, right? We want to be able to actually interpret this diagram in multiple cases. Uh, we, we would like to pass a um, an abstract type function like process in this case, um, parameterized by the input and the output. And we, so, you know, the first set of operations that we need are the ones given by the categorical structure, the identity, and then, and then the, comp the compose is useful mostly because a lot of the, you know, if you're trying to capture a lot of the equations in the literature, they are expressed using uh, the compose operation. Um, so it's useful to have them like this, like, like that. We also would like to add some operations taken from the categorical, the, sort of the Cartesian structure. First, second, uh, this operation merge input, uh, on top of which we can define duplicate as a derived operation. We, we need uh, what is known as an terminal object and to be um, to indicate that we are basically ignoring the input, and so so we have the discard operation, and we also have this. We need this uh, a few combinators from the monoidal structure. Uh, the first one allows us to reassociate right uh, to the right, and then the inverse allows us to reassociate uh, to the left. We also need a way to inject x in a tuple and to inject uh, on the right and on the left. And this is our tensor operation. This is the, this is the combined operation. Uh, so just as a note here, um, the, if you remember, the tensor operates in both the arrows and, and the wires, right? So uh, in this particular example, um, we are using the tuple, tuple 2, as, as the tensor product. And we're using the plus plus combinator or operation to 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 um, to describe a parallel composition of processes. Finally, we have the swap operation and the swap inverse, like this. Now, um, the cool part of this is that we have a bunch of ready-made. We have an, a, specific, a specification of ready-made for us. Basically, the algebraic laws. Uh, that all those operations satisfied, all the things that we glossed over at the beginning. Uh, so we have, you know, each of those gadgets, the category, the, you know, the, the, the ca category, Monel category, it has a few operations, but also it has a few laws to, very, to be very precise about uh, the logical properties. So for the, for the category laws, we need associativity. We need that the identity satisfies this, you know, left and right um, identity. From the tensor loss, this is what I described briefly. 
this 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 explains the relationship between the um, horizontal uh, sorry uh, sequential and parallel composition. We also need this tensor operation to satisfy this identity law. And there's a few other laws that come from the monoidal structure and the symmetric monoidal structure. Um, I'm just gonna I'm not gonna even try to to go into explain those. Um, they're called the triangle equation, pen pentagon equation, hexagon equation, and, and the symmetry uh, operation. Um, in any case, uh, the, the idea is that those equations um, gives us strong guarantees that no matter which, um, you know, which interpretation we give, as long as the, the concrete instances satisfy those laws, then we're good to go. So as a, as a first concrete example, um, you know, let's 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 write um, um, write a few interpreters. Uh, and interpreters in this case means basically just uh, type class instances. So uh, the first one would be uh, we're going to show um, and we need an executable interpreter, of course, using uh, Zio. And Zio, if you are not familiar, it comes with this type called Rio, and uh, it's for all practical purposes. You can think of it as a function from A to either of trouble or B. So it allows us to capture side effects, but it keeps the, the error type uh, fixed, right? But it, it has an input channel and an output channel, which is what we want in this case. And I'm using this uh, Scala 3 new syntax for uh, type class instances. So we need the identity, um, we need the then operation. The, which is the sequential composition, uh, first and second to extract uh, components, uh, merge input, discard. We're going to use. We're going to succeed with an empty tuple. Uh, the associate right and associate left. You know, it's exactly what we would imagine. Just literally transform one tuple into the other. Uh, we also need to provide a way to inject on the right and inject on the left. And uh, the, the parallel composition, um, there's a few ways to define it, but we can use this zip with par operation or combinator that actually runs things um, you know, concurrently. So basically, the Zio interpreter mostly, will mostly delegate all the implementations uh, to Zio built-ins. Oh, and swap, of course. Now, so what we have so far is we have our process DSL ops. Uh, we describe the, the, the Zio um, instance. And of course, one of the main goals of this kind of, uh, if you go this way, so, so you can easily create, you know, for example, graphical representations or many kind of representations. But um, for rendering, instead of jumping straight from the DSL into something low level like graphics, for example, or D3, it is very convenient to use intermediate presentation that still maintains the categorical uh, structure. So the idea is to, to try to keep, to maintain the, the categor categorical structure as much as possible and only you know, rendered or uh, discarded at the last minute. So for that, we will use um, what is called um, the category of port graphs following uh, Spivak and Fung. This is a slightly modified version of uh, what they describe. So it is a category where the arrows are case classes, such as port graph, or basically any data structure representing graphs. So I chose to use a case class with the following elements. So first of all, it has um, a map, an order map of boxes. So if you can see here, um, the keys are uh, correspond to the uh, to, to the boxes A, B, C. <laughs> And then the values are a list of ports. So for example, the box A has three ports uh, with these labels, A on the left and B, C, D on the right. Although you, I, I'm not rendering the, the labels, the internal labels. And then B has uh, three ports on the left and three ports on the right. And C has two ports on the left and one port on the right. This is just uh, the ports of the, of the boxes. And then we have incoming boxes. Um, this is just saying that the whole graph has two input boxes. The first, the first input port will connect 
to the first entry of A and the second to the third entry of B. We have also all the connectivity between the inner elements, uh, all the outgoing uh, ports. Here's another example of a, um, since there's no internal connectivity, there's only one box. I'm running out of time, I'm just gonna go quickly. And uh, this is what I meant. We, we, we can just define the categor categorical structure here. So we have a combined graph such as this. And by the way, the identity arrow in this category, it's just uh, wires, right? Uh, there's uh, one identity for each number of wires. And finally, uh, with this structure in place, it becomes much, much manage manageable to actually, you know, render into something like graphics, which can be very messy. Um, so this is just a way to, to make it much, much easier, right? And that's it. That's all I have. <laughs>